my dear friends and welcome back to another video. So today we have a few Star Wars updates and we begin with The Mandalorian. Following on from yesterday's video where I broke down the Emmy submissions by Lucasfilm, it's now come out that Pedro Pascal was not on set for season 3. Just as we all suspected, he just did the voice. There were a few clashes in terms of scheduling, he was doing work for The Last of Us during the production of The Mandalorian season 3. Here is what Collider said, Pedro Pascal is a very busy man, he enjoys carrying cars cargo across landscapes, usually breathing living cargo, but as a very busy man, this means his time is precious as he can't be in two places at once. Or can he? One of the internet's most hotly debated Mandalorian topics has now been answered definitively by the man himself, who has now confirmed his role in Disney Plus's third season of Mando is limited to voiceover. During a roundtable discussion for the Drama Actor Roundtable series conducted by The Hollywood Reporter, Pedro Pascal was asked if it's true he doesn't have to be present for the show when shooting, and he confirmed for a lot of it he just provides the voiceover. The on-set duties of Din Djarin in the suit mainly fall to the duo Brendan Wayne and Latif Crowder who does the stunts and Pedro compliments Brendan's acting before expanding on the reasons for his absence. And he makes it very clear, it's not just to do with schedule clashes. Here's the quote, there was an extended amount of experimentation being in the suit for a lot of it, and frankly, my body wasn't up for the task as far as four months of it, but I was in it. I was in a significant amount, an elastic amount, especially on the first two seasons, but now we figured it out which is super cool, and amazingly, it gave me the opportunity to be able to go and do something else. As aforementioned, Pedro Pascal compliments the performance of Brendan Wayne, and he doesn't feel as though Din Djarin's character suffered as a result. Although many Star Wars fans would disagree, the character development between Season 2, The Book of Boba Fett, and Season 3 might seem as though he did a reversal on his character growth. And if you remember after Season 3 ended, there were reports that there was an alternate ending that Jon Favreau wanted, whereat Din Djarin's new house on Navarro with Grogu, he was gonna remove his helmet, and just like we saw in the first two seasons, we were gonna to get another glimpse at Din Djarin's face, smiling on the front porch, watching Grogu lift a frog. And I'm really hoping for season 4 we do see more of Din Djarin's face, because it really is an emotional thing, it adds to the overall narrative, and now the Mandalore is reunited, the armor is much more lenient, some Mandos can now remove their helmets, I'd love for Din to be one of them, just as he did for his son in the season 2 finale. But going back to what Collider is saying, it does sound as though there were plans by the creatives to have Din remove his helmet at some point in the third season. But this is when The Last of Us got in the way, and so the writers John Favreau, Dave Filoni, Noah Clore, they had to adjust accordingly. Collider say Pedro Pascal was busy on other projects, something he does note in this roundtable. Being attached to the show allows him to be part of something fun while he's able to work on additional projects, and as an added bonus, this series gets his name for extra clout in a win-win situation. Not just this, but even though he wasn't in the suit whatsoever for the third installment, Lucasfilm are putting him forward for an Emmy nomination. In other Mandalorian news, this is pretty wild. Now we all know, and this was the biggest news of last week, that Disney in September is going to pull the plug on the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. It was far too expensive for the average fan, and there are many reports stating the reasons why it's going to close. But that aside, before they pull the plug, it's now come out that it was going to be rethemed in the style of the world of the Mandalorian instead of the sequel trilogy. All the events on the Star Cruiser took place between The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, but they were going to make it Mando themed. The rap has now reported that the project cost Disney $1 billion, and they even plan to open additional Star Cruisers in Anaheim, Paris, and Tokyo. A number of ideas were thrown around before the closure, and it seems as though the most popular one was to re-theme it as the Mandalorian. I imagine it would have had a more space western feel to it, maybe the bar in Navarro, Din Djarin and Grogu walking around, maybe some of the other Mandalorians like Bo-Katan, Koska Reeves, some other cosplaying staff, and things were going to be much more in line with Jon Favreau's world. But I guess we'll never know. It still would have been very expensive, but from a certain fan point of view, a Mando theme is better than sequel themed. Now on the subject of Emmy submissions for Star Wars, we also have the Andor list now. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I do want to point out a couple of highlights. I think for guest actor submissions, they got this spot on. In the male role, they have Andy Serkis, which was Kino Loy. He was fantastic. One Way Out, for many fans, is the best episode. But also Forrest Whitaker for Saw Gerrera, one of my all-time favourite characters in Star Wars. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. And for guest actress, 
they gave it to Fiona Shaw, Cassian Andor's mum, Marva. I'm ecstatic she's getting recognition, because while in terms of secondary characters Stellan Skarsgård's Luthen really was the highlight of the show for many Star Wars fans, and he's being submitted for Best Supporting Actor in a Drama Series, Fiona Shaw's Marva really was the most emotional performance of the series of Season 1, even the impact her death had on B2Emo, and then that wonderful speech, her deathbed hologram, encouraging the people of Ferex to rise up and fight the Empire. It really didn't get better than that for me. Between her speech and Emic's manifesto, this show really was the embodiment of what it means to be a rebellion, rising up against the powers of oppression, the thumb pressing down on the people. And Tony Gilroy promises more of this in Season 2. We're gonna meet some more rebels, he's gonna build on those from Season 1 who survived. And as I say, one of those characters who has a huge role in Season 2 is Saul Guerrera. Well, one interview around the time that Andor released that really went under the radar is Tony Gilroy explaining the importance of Saul and Luthen, and I want to go through this with you now. Season 2 doesn't release until next year, but this show is one of the ones that gets Star Wars fans super excited, so let's talk about this. This is from the playlist and they say the following, Saw Gerrera is a character that fascinates fans, but in asking Tony Gilroy if we're going to see more of him in season 2, he confirms, but also provides a lengthy answer about the symbolism of revolution. Here's the quote, Yeah, I mean, look, Stellan Skarsgård plays a character that's been building a network and being a talent scout, and a binder and a procurer for all these different things, and this is the moment that he's going to go loud. And as we saw at the end of season 1, he's working with Cassian Andor, so they're going to build the network even further. Other. He goes on to say, Luthen's ensure realization that this is finally the moment to strike and connect all the souls and factions out there fighting and coalesce them into what's later known as the Rebel Alliance. Saw Guerrero, on the other hand, before the Rebel Alliance, thinks all the factions have lost their way, so he doesn't see a need to unite, he doesn't think they all share the same aims. Tony Gilroy goes on to say, and the show really in the second season, is about to say, look, this revolution is hundreds of different groups, and people and rebellions all over the place, that are nascent, they're cooking, and they don't know each other, they're not aware of each other just yet. And you're watching Luthen try to pull it together, and Saw Guerrero is one of the people he deals with, and you're gonna see as the show goes on, the stresses of what that means, taking your company public, and then Gilroy goes on to describe Saw as the original gangster, one of the original gangsters with Luthen. And he says what we see in Rogue One with Yavin 4 is the end point, but what kind of unifications and divisions did it take to get there, to get to Yavin 4 with the Rebel Alliance? And by the time of Rogue One, Guerrero's already been ousted by the Alliance, Mon Mothma wants nothing to do with him, he's too extremist in his methodology, but it's very clear that Gilroy has more story of him to tell, and he's still very important, despite clashing with Bail Organa and Mon Mothma. Gilroy finishes by saying, quote, Saw is very much the first place you look and go, oh god, they should have had more. He doesn't fit in the big tent, he's too crazy. And he gives us a huge tease, season 2 is going to show us more of the drama and infighting between Mon Mothma, Luthen, and other factions too. As I say, Saw is going to be a big part of that as well. So share your thoughts on everything we spoke about in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video guys, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one. May the force be with you always.